When we move from the current crisis to where we need to be in the future, that future and the way we get there cannot be anything but the forefronting of justice. How do we decolonize our decision-making process to empower change from the bottom up? Whether already existing injustices could be deepened by new ecological interventions, already existing colonial conflicts, already existing land conflicts. The solution of green technology might be sustainable, but it's not necessarily just for everyone. Who's participating in decision-making processes? What do those processes actually look like? I think that we need, yes, gender parity, but it's not only a matter of putting a woman to heat up a seat. Is it just about participatory parity, where everybody participates in the existing structures on the same terms? Or how do we really recreate new institutions for participation? Language of climate justice is becoming far more mainstream. But what do we mean by climate justice? The focal topic of the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies this year is justice in sustainability. And it gives us an opportunity to um, both consolidate our work, but also certainly to search for answers to many of the vexing questions that the issue of justice and sustainability presents us. We see uh, an immensely unstable Earth system it is characterized by severe patterns of climate change, a loss of biodiversity, land degradation, displacement of people, and associated patterns of global injustice, not only within generations, but between generations, and also between humans and non-humans. So that is what we see through the lens of the Anthropocene, and that gives us an opportunity, this broader, generalized, imaginary of the Anthropocene. You see farmers, you see women, you see LGBTIQ plus communities, you see black and people of color, indigenous people, everyone coming together and not protesting only because of a pandemic or because of tax reform, rather against of those power relations that trap the population in cycles of inequality, of poverty, of uh, racism, of a structural violence. The climate debt is not just about carbon emissions and methane emissions. The, the climate debt is also needs to address the reparations and the loss and damage that are owed to the global south as a result of 500 years of exploitation, colonization, and, uh, and enslavement. Colonialism has imposed an elitist hierarchy of me on top of somebody. The same colonial history has predefined kind of a color palette ranging from white to black to measure a scale of discrimination. So colonialism has shaped behaviors has shaped structures, imaginaries, conceptions that are still very precedent uh, and linked to the different inequalities that we are still experiencing. Truth and knowledge and expertise and capacity largely comes from the West, from the North. That's a given. That even applies to think tanks, to research institutions, and I'm saying this with all due respect. The Global North is by far, by far, the largest contributor of greenhouse gases. You can see the numbers here. While the global, the poorest uh, of the world have almost none of the emissions and yet are bearing most of the consequences of the climate crisis. This injustice is, we cannot allow this injustice to continue and we cannot allow the Global North governments to pretend to be blind to this reality which they enforce every day. One of the effects of the climate discussion uh, is a reflection on justice because how do you respond to the climate crisis requires a reflection on who has been subject to the to the violence or to the problems created by the uh, climate crisis but also it raises question o questions over responsibility and accountability and it becomes clear that in searching for a solution or to address the consequences of the climate crisis 
all, all these different dimensions of justice come to the fore. And, mm. and this is why green technology doesn't make things automatically and necessarily sustainable because... You, that yeah. is a very good point because we, one must also consider that in the development of uh, green technology, a lot of these resources will come from the global south, lithium exactly. for batteries, for example. Exactly. When we in the global north are looking now um, at the global south for the answers, for solutions, we probably should first focus um, on ourselves and see the problem in the logic itself. For example, we have um, 60 million cars in Germany. If we think we can have electric cars instead of the 60 million cars, there's a huge gap between what is maybe possible, like technically, but would be a just transformation. For example, we have the European Union hydrogen strategy, but over the half of this hydrogen is supposed to come outside from Europe, imported. Uh, which is very interesting because actually the most affordable, the least expensive uh, possibility would be to produce this hydrogen in Europe. That's the imagination that we don't have enough space for these huge renewable uh, energy projects. With this new technology there comes a number of questions which we have to address when we talk about justice issues. For example, who will use this energy when it's produced? Is it only transported to Europe or also will be local people uh, profit from this energy? We can see that the emerging hydrogen economy does come with several risks, both on the political economy side and also on the social ecological side. Um, there is kind of a gap between the techno technological euphoria and the real risks for nature and society along the hydrogen production chain. There's a massive need of water, of sweet water, of course. So this may cause water stress or may come with changes to the water pricing. If we say like we should scale up renewable resources, for example, solar, fine. Where is the knowledge coming from? How do we make sure people in the global south are well equipped to service and to maintain this? At what cost? At whose cost? Justice is about ensuring that there is equity, that there is fairness, that there are rights-based approaches, that it's democratic practices that we respect. And here, I would not make a distinction between uh, you know, justice more broadly and climate justice, because these are all connected. Environmental justice is often described as uh, having three dimensions, claims for distribution or redistribution, claims for recognition of uh, cultural identity, and claims for representation or participation. So if we think about distribution, uh, the affirmative approach is saying, well, we need to just transfer resources between one group and another so that everybody has the same, everybody has an equal distribution of resources. Um, whereas a more transformative approach is really saying, what are the root causes of these inequalities? And how do we have, how can we transform the entire system? You cannot achieve distributive justice without procedural justice. Procedural justice means that the, those who need to be at the decision-making tables need to be capacitated, supported, resourced, valued, respected, relationships built, power dynamics addressed. And then perhaps also something that, that is um, critical for us is justice as recognition. Um, meaning that through our discussions about justice and those who we involve with in this, these, these discourses, um, we need to show respect to multiple um, worldviews. Um, so certainly to me, science can also be a form of colonialism in the sense that it excludes indigenous forms of knowledge and science, which is also science. Yeah, me too. I think if you have like sustainable projects, you always have to look like at those three dimensions that we talked about. And then it can really be sustainable and also just, I think. Because if that is, isn't given, you don't really have sustainability and justice together. Absolutely. We understand transformation as occurring as a result of productive conflict. 
Uh, so we see conflict as a productive force, not something to be avoided or to be resolved. Uh, and that through these conflicts, uh, different types of power can be transformed. We have a very tiny majority that controls a huge swath of the wealth in the world. And this has political reverberations. The problem is not technical. If you talk to scientists, if you talk to activists, it's very clear what needs to be done. It was the case with COVID, it's the case with the climate crisis. The problem is mainly political because the political class, even in our so-called liberal democracies, they are not, they are beholden to corporate interests. It's, it's precisely mm. the lack of democracy that has created the crisis. And, and, the, and it's also the lack of democracy that is delaying a solution to the crisis. Whether political institutions can react quickly, I think they can. And we've seen this with COVID. They I could. I mean, they could. They, they could act quickly and very decisively if there is If the crisis is perceived as a crisis, the problem is, is that the, just the climate crisis, but certainly the broader socio-ecological crisis is not yet perceived as a crisis. But I think what Berit also said is, she was a very important point that the state during COVID wasn't a more democratic state. It was a more authoritarian Absolutely. state, more centralized state. And there were, you could also, you could see a lot of injustices, but even more important, that we think about justice issues, I would say, you know, because if we want to have rapid change, there will be also injustices. Achieving justice and ensuring fairness and equity is all about power, all about power. Climate science must shape the law and the law must be responsive to the state of the art climate science while meaningfully translating the planetary boundaries determined by the science into legal boundaries. That would be my, my dream and vision. We'd shift completely out of this kind of international multilateral COP type approach to ongoing processes that are really bottom up and participatory and meaningful. Seeing that unfortunately uh, the governance level is failing on achieving the ambitious policies that we need and I think on a global scale and uh, on many local and national levels it's really social movements that are fighting for a change and achieving uh, important small victories so far. If we really are to have a chance at achieving anything at all beyond papers beyond academia, beyond just talking. We need real action on the streets and that's what we are building. The only way we can really fight back and against uh, the corporate interests that have a stake in the status quo is mass-based organizations around a common program. Agents of change have developed and are developing multiple strategies to cope, to mitigate, to adapt, to resist to these structures. And such practices include solidarity economy, agroecology, land management to adapt to climate change, how to prevent crop losses, how to reduce workloads, understanding the time schedule of households, how to increase nutritional intake, how to improve water management for today and for tomorrow. These solutions for a more sustainable future already exist and they look as diverse, as beautiful, as smart <laughs> as the woman that we are seeing here. At least people are seeing it. At least it's in the media. At least people are engaging around it. And in that sense, throwing paint at a uh, Klimt painting is perhaps not exactly the right route to take, but it does focus attention on both the frustration and the urgency that we need to do something about this. But I think the project has started and I think it's ongoing. I think that is positive. Is that positive enough? Yes.